Hello, I'm Kate A. Hardy and welcome to Tales from the Vestry, readings from my novels and short stories. And I'm going to read now part three of uh, The Panto Horse End. This is the part where Marion is returned to her bedroom after her meeting with Dr. Greatrix. <clears throat> As Marion padded over to the sheets of paper on the wall, her bare feet noted the texture of the carpet. She glanced down and recognised the orange shag pile of her childhood room. If she were to open the wardrobe, would David Casty and Donny Osmond grin down from the back of the door? The first piece of paper appeared to be a chart, and the second a list of suggestions. Do try our hobby room, flower arranging with Mrs Plough every Tuesday morning. Exercise classes with Reverend Silt every morning after prayer. Coffee and tea available at any hour in the night canteen. Breakfast from 8, emergency reassurance call 245. Marion switched to the chart. The lines seemed to represent truth, emotions and motivation. Whatever she had said and done yesterday had obviously worked. The three traces were moving steadily upwards towards the cloud symbols at the top of the chart. Do I want to go to heaven? Her thoughts were interrupted by a tinny chime from the clock. Seven, an hour before breakfast. Opening the bathroom door, Marion discovered an avocado sweet, just like the one her mother had chosen all those years ago. She showered, revelling in hot water and a normal stature dried off with a scratchy but clean towel and stepped back into the bedroom to investigate the wardrobe. Her yellow skirt suit was there, the rip meticulously mended. Hanging alongside were other garments, clothes that looked and felt slightly familiar, a pink pointy collared shirt, beige flared trousers and that cat suit. The day she had bought it came racing back, thundery, her scalp pricking with excitement as she considered the first date with Tommy. Unhooking the hanger, she slipped off the silky mauve fabric and held it to her face. A faint smell of roses lay in the cloth. She smiled as she located underwear and then wriggled into the garment. It still fitted. The wardrobe mirror reflected a more carefree person than she remembered. There was no sign of Hamish, the bookshop owner in the cafe. But the old man Mar Marion had met in the corridor was sitting at a table reading a book. Picking up her tray of tea and scrambled eggs, Marion went over to the table. Could I join you? The watery eyes looked up from the text. Aye, lass, how they're finding it then? Well, oddly, I feel good. I had great tricks, did that? Yesterday, but I can't remember much of it, to be honest. <laughs> he nodded and pointed a spoon at her garment. Nice colour, that. Suits thy red hair. She smiled. Hardly any grey yet. Planning on internal life, then? I haven't had much time to reflect on it, but I don't think heaven's for me, really. The crow's feet on his papery skin merged as he grinned. Someone waiting for thy down there, like my Marge, eh? Tommy, my husband. Get lazy, don't we, he said, a tear forming and rolling from one of his grey eyes. Take folk for granted. Marion poured tea and pondered on his words. Lazy. The shrink she'd once seen in Tooting Beck had said as much. But she'd chosen to ignore the advice, cancelling the next appointment and walking out into the winter mist with all the usual dissatisfaction eating into her soul. I think you're absolutely right, she said, but I'd like to change, work like you are. Her companion chewed thoughtfully on a piece of toast, washed it down with a glug of tea and then reached out a trembling hand. He patted her on the shoulder. That's almost there, lass. That's tough part, knowing it. Dr Greatrix was late. He appeared puffing, tripping over undone laces, his remaining strands of hair flopping across his face. The overstuffed briefcase undid itself with a leathery belch and the contents flopped to the floor. Oh, so sorry, my dear. Emergency in the St. Hippolyte Chapel, he said, unlocking the door. Hyper prayer ventilation. Forgetting to breathe while praying. It occasionally happens with the over-keen ones. 
The earthbound Marion might have squeezed her lips into a cat's anus shape and huffed at the lateness. This Marion found herself commiserating with him and the afflicted person as she helped collect his dispersed papers. It felt good, all floating warmness and tingly limbs. In the office, she took her place opposite the doctor and looked at the items on the desk while he rearranged his bag. Amongst the pen pots and yesterday's mugs, she noticed an ivory carving of a water buffalo, an impossibly familiar water buffalo. A memory sparked as she picked it up. Be careful with that, Tinky. We bought it on our honeymoon. Her father had smiled wistfully and taken taken the carving gently from her, replacing it carefully on the mantelpiece. Usually so busy, he'd swept her into a hug and whispered croaked words. I miss her so much, Marion. Dr Greatrix was smiling placidly, arms folded on the desk as Marion bumped back to the present. She returned the carving to its plane of dust and looked at him tearfully. Let's talk about your father today, said the doctor, glancing at the buffalo. Marion nodded. She actually wanted to talk about him. A question hovered. Doctor, Marion, will I get to talk to... The boss, he smiled. Everyone asks that. Of course they would. God, the eternal one, the big guy. Let's, let's see. He found Marion's file and flicked through a few pages. Well, he peered at her over his wiry glasses. Tomorrow, nine o'clock, room 1070. Marion awoke to the low drone of a hoover in the corridor. She lay for a while, trying to recall what she was supposed to do today. The boss. She remembered suddenly and scrambled out of bed. What should one wear when about to be confronted by the bearded deity? Taking her yellow suit from the wardrobe, Marion dressed, curled her hair into a bun and added some pearl earrings. She looked at the clock, just in time for coffee. The canteen was empty, just the currenty eyed dinner lady arranging Battenberg cake on a stand. Hello, dear. Off to see the boss, then. How could you tell? asked Marion, taking a tray. Seen it a thousand times. The clothes, the wary eyes, a bit like first day at school, I suppose. Did you see him? said Marion, but a question was lost in the steam of the hot milk machine. There you go, dear, said the woman, returning with a foamy cup of coffee. Poached egg? No, thanks. I don't seem to have much appetite. Marion sat at the window and gazed out onto a clear day. In the distance, she could make out a road swooping and curving upwards, seemingly suspended by nothing. At its end, the silver arabesques of a vast gate pierced the towering, towering cumulus. Cumulus. Cumulus? I don't know. Big clouds. A solitary vehicle was making its way towards Pendingville, a white stretch limo. Is it there, the car? called the dinner lady. Marion turned towards her. Long, white. That's it, the boss, right on time. Marion finished her coffee and took the cup back. So this is really it, God? The woman nodded. Remember, be truthful. It's all in the notes anyway. The lift pinged and the attendant that day, an Elvis look-alike, or possibly Elvis, wished Marion good luck. Walking down the red, swirly, carpeted hallway, Marion felt her life passing in front of her. A million disconnected frames from a jerky, bleached film. Holidays, striped windbreaks, fish and chips in the car, rain lashing the windscreen. Tommy's hand closing over hers as he proposed. Dancing on the school stage, applause as loud as the storm that had pushed over the old apple tree in their garden. Their garden. How she would love to see it again. The dream pictures dissolved as Marion stopped outside the stated room. She knocked and waited, expecting a gruff voice to invite her in. Instead, a reedy voice shrilled, Mrs Smith, please come in. She opened the door. A diminutive, grey-haired woman dressed in a pink sari stood in the middle of the room. 
Marion walked over and shook the proffered, delicate hand. But you're, I mean... God, yes, that's me. For the time being, anyway. We take turns, you see. It's only fair. Sit down, please. Taking a seat in the gestured leatherette armchair, Marion looked around at the dust-covered Venetian blinds, dismembered computers and pizza boxes. If she was ever to imagine a holy office, it certainly wouldn't have been like this. Will I be able to go back? she asked, unable to contain the question any longer. God reached into a wooden box on the desk, took out a cigar and sat down. She lit up and eyed Marion thoughtfully through a curl of smoke. Most of last evening I studied your case. You still have work to do, but most of it can be completed on earth. Pendingville is a busy place and the rooms are much in demand. If someone like yourself has made rapid progress, they can return under surveillance, of course. Marion felt an urge to run round the desk and kiss God, but it probably was not what was expected. Thank you, she said neatly. No thanks required. You have made the changes yourself. However, there are a few things I would like to run through this morning. Marion sat back and listened, the pink silk and tiny woman gradually fading to just a pair of deep brown eyes that filled her mind. Marion! Marion! The familiar voice was croaky with concern. Marion started awake and stared, not into brown, but blue-green eyes. God? Tommy stared back at her, brow furrowed. Darling, you're in hospital! Oh, the wound. I, I was dead. Someone else had stepped around Tommy and smiled shakily. The director. Arnie, that was his name. Blimey, Marion, you had us all worried there. It's so good to see you alive. Marion's head ached. Where was Pendingville, the canteen, the shagpile carpet? Tommy, I don't understand. I met God, really. He smiled and hugged her close. You suffered a mild heart attack brought on by stress, slight sword wound and possibly suffocation. The fart, she murmured. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, said Arnold the butcher, looking around the bed curtain. He placed a bouquet of white roses on the bed. A small, more fragrant offering, and I'll be the horse bum next time. No need, said Arnie. We'd like you to play the Duchess of York, and I think we might jettison the horse anyway. Marion smiled waveringly as tears welled. They were kind. People were kind. Lovely. Real. Can we go home, Tommy? He grinned back and she remembered how much she loved those laugh lines. The doctor said, couple more tests and home tomorrow. Marion got out of the car and stood looking at the house. She'd never really studied it before, dissatisfied as she had been with the move. Just a 1920 semi, like hundreds of others in suburban London. But today it was a palace. Come on, Em, called Tommy. Come and see what the builders managed to get finished in the kitchen. Marion walked up the path, noting each tiny detail with new eyes, the magnolia tree, the red door paint and the scent of climbing jasmine. Stepping into the hall, she glanced at the family photos that Tommy had assembled on the console table. Her father looked up from a picture taken when she was a child, both of them smiling, standing next to the Hillman Minx. I'd like to go and visit father, soon, today in fact. I've taken time off work, so whenever you like. Coffee? Marion turned her gaze from the picture and kissed Tommy. Please, but first I want to change. I think I've gone off this yellow thing. Maybe just some jeans and a shirt. He nodded, tweaked her nose and went off to make coffee, a skip in his stride. Marion kicked off her shoes and walked upstairs to their bedroom. She stood for a while, hands on the windowsill, gazing out at the beauty of the gardens opposite. Each person's ideas and plans mapped out in lawn, flower borders and paths. She sighed and shook her head as she looked up to the clouds. What an extraordinary dream she had experienced, so unbelievably real. Leaving the window, Marion located jeans and a t-shirt in the walnut chest of drawers. 
She ran a hand over its smooth top, recalling where it had sat in her father's house, until that day he had moved to the home and cumbersome antique furniture had been relevant no longer. She would take him the white roses. He still loved flowers. She stripped off her skirt, noticing as she did so a slight raise in the texture of the cloth. She turned the garment to the light and peered closely at the weave, just making out tiny stitches in a triangle shape, perhaps where a rip might have occurred and then been cleverly repaired. Coffee's ready, echoed Tommy's voice in the hallway. Marion folded the skirt and placed it in the bottom of the wardrobe, where it sat, seeming to give off an odd lemony light. She closed the door. Coming, darling. The end. Um, I hope you liked the story. I'm actually developing it into a novel at the moment. So I'll see you again soon and don't forget to give me a like and perhaps subscribe. Thanks very much. Bye.